Schaefer, the producer and host of Riff Raff, the academic book television program. My guest today is Nicholas Delbanco, who is here to discuss his latest book, The Lost Suitcase, Reflections of the Literary Life. Welcome to Riff Raff. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. In a way, your presence here represents a kind of historical moment for us, because until now, all of our programs have been with authors of scholarly monographs. But as I hope you know, all of us here at Rip Rap have a deep fondness for you and your work you. because of your ability to look at and discuss the life of those who value the craft of writing. So when we found out about this book, The Lost Suitcase, your latest addition to a long list of literary accomplishments, we were delighted to have an opportunity to talk with you about writing and those who practice this craft, a topic of interest not only to our guests, but to our viewers. Uh, I must say that reading The Lost Suitcase is a pure delight. Um, Thank you. It does indeed have your fingerprints on every page, is a phrase you use in it. But I'd say it's more than just a matter of commas and the usage of the semicolon and the subordinate clause. Your writing has a quiet, reflective style that's shaped by the craftsman's attention to detail. How did you come up with the notion for this book, and how did you run across the anecdote, a anecdote about Hemingway's valise that serves as the metaphoric structure? You know, your introduction is so flattering, I'd, I'd rather just sit in solemn silence <laughs> and let you keep going. Do I have to answer that question? <laughs> um, a couple of things to say. Uh, the first is that I'm not breaking that much uh, new ground for you since the majority of this book is in fact nonfiction and a series of essays uh, about the writing life, reflections on the literary life as the subtitle suggests. I've been in this business for more years than I care to count and, and more than it's always comfortable to remember and after you've been shooting off your mouth for decades, much less years. Uh, there's a certain accumulation of verbiage, uh, a certain number of essays that I had printed before, speeches I'd given, etc. And when I was clearing out the desk a few years ago, I thought, hmm, this stuff sort of sticks together. It has a kind of coherence. And that's in part what I meant by fingerprints all over every page. You can't really disguise yourself no matter how much you try to, no matter how avidly you attempt to throw your voice, it is still in effect the same series of inflections. So I began to notice a certain constancy or at least a consistency of concern in um, the pages that I had published over a good 20 years in various literary magazines and publications and what have you. And I proposed to Columbia University Press that uh, we make a collection. They agreed, um, and everything uh, seemed easy until I began to grow bored by the process of uh, accretion and accumulation itself. And I think a pretty good rule of thumb when you're engaged in a work is that if it bores you, it will definitely do so uh, to and for a stranger. It, I didn't mean it, in short, to be a just you know, a grab bag of everything I'd published that wasn't yet between covers. I wanted it to have a kind of coherence, a kind of shape, and a kind of um, linked thematic series of concerns. And right, right, right about that time, I um, was thinking about Ernest Hemingway and this anecdote of the lost suitcase which wasn't really that hard to stumble on. It's relatively famous um, as a part of his history and lore. Uh, he talks about it uh, in A Movable Feast, which is a book that published posthumously, and his biographers all make quite a fuss about it. I should probably say very rapidly what this story consists of. It's um, Hemingway, although he always talks about himself in his early years as penniless and at penury's edge, <coughs> nonetheless somehow seemed to fetch up on the Riviera and uh, in the Swiss Alps or in Pamplona running the bulls. And one of those years, when he was just 23 uh, and living in Paris with his first wife, Hadley, 
he went down to Switzerland to establish a kind of beachhead or mountain head, I suppose, um, uh, to get some work done. And once he'd found a, a place that he thought she'd like and they could live in for the winter, he uh, telegraphed her and said, come on down and would you mind bringing all my work with you, uh, all the drafts and carbons even uh, of the stories that he had been working on in Paris during what we think of as his apprentice years. Uh, shortly thereafter, he published the first of these, uh, three stories and ten poems, and then a little collection called In Our Time, and it's really magnificent stuff. I mean, he was at the very top of his form in, in his early twenties, and uh, we have a lot to be grateful for in those brief stories that are collected. But this anecdote um, is the reverse. Uh, she lost everything that... Um, she had fetched and gathered so scrupulously and brought to Switzerland, probably in the Gare de Lyon, the valise got stolen. And according to her, according to him, according to his biographers, he never quite got over that. Uh, it was a kind of emblem of collapse, uh, and uh, it certainly wrecked uh, his sense of good humor, probably wrecked his marriage. Um, embittered him about the whole process in a way. And re years and decades later, he was still mourning the loss and saying that was my you know, best first shot. Um, anyhow, I found myself, because I'm obviously no longer a young and promising writer, um, thinking from the vantage of, um, of uh, the best middle-aged one uh, about what it meant to be hopeful, full of possibility, dreaming of genius in, beneath, uh, in between um, the folders and then the suitcase. And it gave rise to really a fiction, uh, a novella called The Lost Suitcase, which um, pretty much is about the same series of things that the essays are. I've given you a very long answer to a rather short question, but that's how the book became something of a hybrid, in a way, a cross between fiction and nonfiction. And I like to think that the two components sort of play off against each other. They do indeed. In fact, one of the basic elements used in the novella is this repetition of the story, and that is also part of the writer's craft, revising, and you show how you consider the same anecdote from different ways. Precisely so. Um, Hemingway said, uh, in the only account we have of that loss from him, that, uh, you know, it, as I said, wrecked everything. He couldn't get over it. He, he raced back to Paris himself on the night train, ransacked the apartment, found nothing, couldn't believe it still. There's a little bit that was left uh, salvaged of that early work. The story, in fact, called Up in Michigan. Um, had been out on submission, and therefore um, uh, the magazine that took it had a copy. And a few pages of Fathers and Sons, what would become Fathers and Sons, uh, another great short story of his, where elsewhere, were out of the apartment. But Hadley had been, you know, thorough and scrupulous and had taken almost everything. I found myself, though, just imagining alternate versions, hmm? which is to say, imagine that instead of being scrupulous, she'd been furious um, and threw the things out on purpose and then told him they were lost. He gave her good and sufficient reasons for fury in those early years. Imagine, alternately, that she was much smarter than he and a much better editor than he and knew that the work wasn't any good and decided to throw it out. Yeah, uh, there's some very interesting <laughs> passages about that part of it. Right. Or imagine that she really wasn't interested in him in the first place and didn't care whether um, somebody took her suitcase or not because she was having a dalliance with somebody else on the train. That's the sort of variation on the theme uh, that The Lost Suitcase consists of. Um, as you noted, I, I tip the cap with some regularity to Stevens's great 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, so I look at this... Um, I look at this loss of the suitcase in, in, in many different contexts. Yeah, there's all these lists of 13, finding the suitcase, of losing the suitcase, of what's in right. the suitcase. So. Right, right. It does come in part from that poem, in part for the 13, re from 
another thing that I love, which is uh, Cash uh, Bundren's 13 Reasons for Building His Coffin, uh, the way he does in Faulkner's great novel, As I Lay Dying. And m mostly it's a musical effort to, to have a kind of repeating strain, if you and will. Cadence. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the luggage, at one point, I think in one version, even talks about the muse and what that so it becomes sort of an allegorical. Yes, what, one of the versions of <laughs> Hadley arriving, um, but this time empty-handed, mm -hmm. is, uh, is that she, as I say, she represents, of course, the muse. That, in fact, is the final version, because in the end, um, the old man, uh, and here I am, in part imagining Hemingway, in part um, reporting on what I know of him in his great old age, in part, I suppose, spelling future ghosts. The old man is sitting by himself, and he suddenly realizes he has nothing left to say, that the muse who had blessed him so long and so often has just simply abandoned him, uh, has brought nothing with her when she comes. And uh, he confronts, as he perhaps should have earlier, uh, the specter of silence. Hemingway, as you know, perhaps, um, was in the last years of his life genuinely wrecked. Probably quite a lot of that had to do with how much gin he drank and how many um, hogsheads of wine he consumed. Part of that, I suspect, had to do with the number of injuries he sustained, uh, the times he, he concussed and fell out of planes and so on. Part of that, I think, was probably a hereditary um, disposition towards uh, depression. There was a lot of suicide uh, in his family. Uh, there's been suicide since. His mother thought it was acute and good idea to send him his father's shotgun, the one with which his father had blown out his own brains. And towards the end of his life, uh, he went to the Mayo Clinic uh, for a series of electroshock treatments. And he, who had been so famously um, articulate and, and able to compose, was literally unable to do so. Uh, he was asked, for instance, to give a few lines of praise to John F. Kennedy for the inaugural in 1961, and he couldn't do it. I mean, he couldn't write a single sentence. And I, I've been moved by that, by, the, by considering uh, what an old man, he wasn't actually all that old, he was 61 when he shot himself. Um, but for the last few years of his life had been, for all practical purposes, um, bereft. Anyway, when you juxtapose that to the, to the brilliantly accomplished and, and fluent um, young writer, it's quite a stark contrast. So I, I went in that novella from the one to the other. There is implicit in this, too, as I was reflecting on it, the notion of violence and the need to kind of cultivate the psyche or whatever comprises the thing that allows us to write. And the, sometimes we offend greatly. And um, it was just another thought I had as I reflected on this idea of the loss of how events can impact mm -hmm. and have that devastating element in our lives. Well, I think that's uh, certainly the case. I mean, uh, at a certain point, uh, when you are no longer an apprentice author, no longer the youngest of writers, and you've used up your store of available knowledge, by which I mean your first book about your childhood, your next book about your young adolescence, uh, your third about your first love, your one about your marriage, one about your divorce, if, uh, if these things happen, um, then, you're, then you have to look around you and try and acquire some information from the available world and the way it impacts upon you and the events to which you are witness become more and more likely the subject of your later work. Hemingway was, after all, uh, in an important degree, a reporter, and much of his fiction um, did come from the important wars he witnessed, the important um, places he went, etc. 
One of the things that fascinated me about the book is all these details. You're mm -hmm. a master of these details. And I selected a few, but I, there's many, many that uh, I found, I'd read that and I'd like to reflect more on it. But one of them, the most obvious, is mentoring Avery Hopwood right. as a visitor or a guest at a gallery reception. Well, I am, as, as you know, the uh, director of the Hopwood Awards program at the University of Michigan, and um, in that sense very much in his debt, so I thought I'd tip my cap um, back at him uh, and put him uh, in, uh, in these covers. It's not wholly implausible. Uh, s some of the details many of the details in that uh, novella are actual from what I know of Hemingway's life. Um, I don't know if he ever met uh, Avery Hopwood. I somehow doubt it because I think I would know if he had. But Hopwood was um, a good friend uh, of Gertrude Stein's and Alice B. Toklas. And he spent quite a lot of time in Paris. In fact, um, the day before he died, uh, which was by accident on the French Riviera. He'd sent a letter to uh, Gertrude Stein saying, you know, um, hope to see you soon, what a wonderful party we had last week, et cetera, et cetera. So their circles intersected, um, and it was, after all, the same roaring 20s, and um, I just thought I would tip my cap to Uncle Avery oh, and put him in there. Yeah. Uh, he no doubt went to galleries and since I was inventing the show, I could invent the audience list. <laughs> because of what he's done with the University of Michigan in creating this program, it, it really has had a lasting impact on writing and, and Oh, absolutely. Uh, Hopwood had um, a wonderful instinct. Uh, he, he went to the University of Michigan um, and was graduated in, in 1905, um, decided, uh, astonishingly, to become a playwright because he thought that playwrights had a better chance of making money than any of the <laughs> other forms of uh, creative endeavor. I say that's astonishing because I think the odds are very long uh, nowadays. Though nowadays the equivalent is probably, um, or the equivalent to what he did uh, is probably screenwriting or a situation comedy, uh, com composition for television. Anyway, Hopwood made absolute pots of money. Um, there was a time when he had four plays running on Broadway at once. And um, he was by all odds the most successful in commercial terms playwright of his period, rather like the Neil Simon of his time. And part of his estate, he left to the University of Michigan with the wonderful proviso that it be used to encourage student creative writing. Writing not only in, in theater, but also in the novel, in the short story, in nonfiction, in uh, poetry. And so we've been able to give out money um, really ever since in his name and from his um, bequest. Um, by now, we're giving out almost $100,000 a year to encourage student writing, to reward it. And it's approaching almost two million in, in, in the total take. You've been to the Hopwood Room, you know what a wonderful uh, sort of locus that is uh, for young writers. The magazines are there, the pot of coffee is there, and, and the people come and chat and visit and keep in touch. I'm very grateful for the specificity of his donation because I think otherwise, it, you know, we would have had an Avery Hopwood wing of some library or would have gotten lost uh, under a piece of cement uh, or in a bookshelf or three. The Hopwood program is by all odds the longest running and probably still the most famous of support systems for um, student writing. And so, as I say, I thought the least I could do was Oh, I thought Bring it was, in the book. Yeah, I thought it was, it was very delightful. And because of there's this lingering, ongoing mm -hmm. thing that has also flourished, I think, because of your careful stewardship and those associated with the program, so that it's grown stronger uh, over the years. Well, thank you. Thank you. One of the other details and is about the uh, tools and rituals of Edward, the main character in, mm -hmm. in the novella, the, the carefully sharpened pencils and his desk. And it, it it's not until you do a lot of writing that you care passionately about those things. 
Well, that's an example of something um, I do know uh, about Hemingway, or at least I've read about Hemingway. Uh, there's a wonderful interview uh, of him conducted by George Plimpton uh, in the Paris Review quite a long time ago, um, relatively early on in, in, in the magazine's um, history. And in it, Plimpton reports that Hemingway did um, stand upright at his desk to work, partly, indeed, principally because he had a bad back, um, and also that he sort of kept himself at his desk by sharpening pencils. So those details, as opposed to the arrival of Hopwood uh, in uh, the gallery, uh, are, if not real, at least translated. I should make it clear um, that I don't call my character Ernest or his wife Hadley. Uh, it's Edward and Annalise, because I, I want to be using them sort of as occasions for the imagination rather uh, than as an act of biography. This is a piece of fiction. Uh, everything that surrounds it in the lost suitcase is, to the best of my ability, um, uh, truthful or truth-telling. But uh, my Edward uh, borrowed Hemingway's habit of sharpening pencils and standing up. Yes, that's right. Well, well and, and it functions as a work of fiction, so it has mm -hmm. its own reality. And, and its own rules. And actually, I think a somewhat better <laughs> place with it. Th there is also uh, that marvelous anecdote about the English author, or actor, I should say, whose career having faltered goes to the left luggage office of the train station to find his misplaced talent, uh, saying that this is a little thing, a bright, shining thing of no particular importance, but it does matter to me. Yes. Um, that is a marvelous anecdote, and uh, I wish I had invented that, but I heard it. I heard it from the wonderful old, uh, still living um, English actor Jack Gwillem, who had heard it from uh, the great English uh, and now uh, recently deceased actor, Sir Ralph Richardson. He had been with Ralph Richardson uh, on the old Vic, I think, and, and uh, I have this only halfway in my mind, but uh, Richardson had been a great success early on and um, a uh, sort of a matinee idol, and then his career faltered. Um, people panned his let's say Hamlet, people panned his Macbeth. And Gwilym was in uh, the third such failure uh, with him, and he saw uh, Richardson sitting uh, in the um, dressing room afterwards saying, I've, I've lost my talent. <laughs> I've lost my talent. He says, and, and I know what I shall do. I shall go to the left luggage um, uh, office at at Waterloo, and I shall say to the gentleman there, I says, I've lost my talent. It's a little thing of no particular importance, but it does matter to me. And, and, and I'll return tomorrow if you found it a little bright, shining thing. Please, please do keep it for me. And I, I, I loved that image, and so I you know, transposed it into this text. Um, and there are lots of private cap tips like that scattered there throughout. It's a, it's a lovely evocation of, of what all creative people fear or are concerned about. What are the ways of sustaining what you're doing? And as you become more proficient, can you still do it? Well, I think that's so. And I think that that's, that's the, deep, um, the deep rhythm and also the deep query of that particular um, book and, or that particular novella because in fact, I know of no example more agonizing than Hemingway's. Um, he wrote uh, till he was unable to write, as I've just suggested. Um, but the language of his last years is, is, is utterly awful, by comparison at least, with, with the great early and early middle work. And what's so curious about it, and what has given me real pause, is that for all practical purposes, it's the same language, by which I mean if you put early Hemingway into a computer and had it scan where the commas are, how many conjunctions there are, how long the sentences are, um, how many nouns, uh, how many present participles, etc., 
it would probably look like the same style as that with which he wrote in his final years. But whereas the first work is full of consequence and deep meaning, the, uh, the late work, uh, most completely awful, is this most recent posthumous publication, a book called True at First Light. The late work is a kind of parody of itself, which is one of the reasons that he's so easy to parody. I mean, he, he began that particular industry. Anyway, um, to think of, of the distance between the genuine promise and achievement of his early career and the, the famous but empty uh, work of his late is to consider a cautionary tale. And now that, you know, I'm closer to 60 than any other round number, and um, uh, this is my 18th book, it is, of course, appropriate for me to start worrying about when one should hang up the spikes and whether the talent is there and whether I'm fooling myself in the attempt to fool others um, that I still have something to say. And so I, I puzzled over that hard. Um, and if I got lucky, which I sort of feel I did in this book, um, the puzzlement is its own answer. There are elements, as we've been talking about throughout this whole book of insights. Mm -hmm by a master of the writing craft, and I'll take the liberty of calling you that. To those just starting out, um, some of the most pronounced are at the, at the end, and actually throughout the novella, uh, including questions that the narrator asks about what happened afterward, the apparatus of mm -hmm. celebrity, mm -hmm. which I think is also, that's a whole interesting question itself, and what remains remembered. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the comments, the entire chapter on the letter to a young fiction writer, which right. I really enjoyed, um, it, which is an extended reverie on the requirements of the literary life. And my most favorite was the tagline from Rilke about uh, he was a poet, which is to say he despised the inexact. Yes, that's a beautiful phrase. Um, it. Uh I think that's my translation. Uh, the German, if you'll, if you'll forgive uh, my pronunciation, is er war ein Dichter. Das heißt, er hasste das ungefähr. Uh, he was a poet, which is to say he despised the inexact, or he hated the approximate. Interestingly enough, that, that line comes from Rilke's only sustained piece of prose, which is a, a kind of fictive autobiography that he compiled uh, during the period that he was living in Paris, working, in fact, as uh, Auguste Rodin's secretary. This is an excellent book, and I enjoyed it, as I have your other books, uh, The Lost Suitcase. And like I said, we wanted to have you on the program because you're talking about writing. Thank you for being on, Rip Rat. It's a true pleasure to be here and to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly, um, I haven't had a chance to read it because yeah, I've had to read it.